Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. By far, my favorite kind of fishing is for largemouth bass. And in recent history, our state record has been broken several times, which is largely in part due to the introduction of the Florida strain largemouth bass into our state. Today, we're going to follow along the story of one hatchery's crucial role in making monster largemouth bass right here in Oklahoma. Oklahoma State largemouth bass record was caught at Cedar Lake in March of 2013. The largemouth broke the previous record caught in 2012 also in Cedar Lake. And since 1983, the record has changed hands nine times. Before 1983, well, the record stood for nearly 40 years. And each of the past record fish since 1983, all but one was a bass with Florida genes. In the early 70s, Lake Latonka was the first lake stocked by the Wildlife Department with Florida strain largemouth. And coincidentally, in 1983, the long-standing largemouth bass record was broken at Lake Latonka. The native northern largemouth bass very seldom grows much larger than about eight pounds. It can get bigger. Obviously, there's other states that have state records that are bigger than that. Uh, we actually had a state record in Oklahoma that was 12 pounds that was a, a northern strain bass, a very old one. But in general, the chances of producing trophy fish like that are much better if you have Florida genes in the system. When you stock Florida bass in a lake, if everything works right, eight or ten years down the road, you have the chance of producing eight pound, 10 pound, 12 pound, or even larger bass. Doesn't work all, all the time in all the places. But one place it has worked has been Lake of the Arbuckles. Tournament anglers have recently been catching record stringers of bass. We're talking quality fish that rival any others in the country. And in March of 2014, tournament anglers Marco Valka and Doyle Eidelman made history with a five fish limit totaling, get this, 42.71 pounds. It was unheard of or unthought of to bring 40 pounds, let alone in the state of Oklahoma. I mean, you hear about that in Florida or, you know, South Texas, Falcon Lake, but we can do it right here in our backyard now. I think it has a lot to do with the way we're stocking our fish and the Florida strain. Uh, it's, it just shows. Overall, the program has been, I think, very successful. It's, uh, it's produced a lot of quality fishing for a lot of people. And, and you know, fishing is all about hope. You go out there and you, wanna, you hope you're gonna catch something. And if you know that there's an eight or 10 or 12 pound bass swimming around in that lake, um, it just adds fuel to the fire uh, because you know that potentially the next cast could be that fish. Well, you know how the story ends, but let's go back to the beginning where it all starts at the Durant State Fish Hatchery. What we're doing today is we're certifying our future brood stock that are going to be used here on the hatchery. Uh, this is a process where we take fish that are approximately a year and a half old, uh, we'll take them out of the pond, and we will take a DNA test to verify that these are truly pure Florida bass that we use in our production of fingerling fish here at the hatchery. One of the reasons that we're certifying these brood stock is that each year we need to bring on a new year class and more brooders. Over time, as the fish age, uh, the, the fish that we've used as brood stock get older, uh, those fish die or they're retired and stocked in a lake. So each year we need to bring on new and younger fish uh, for our brood stock production.
Uh, right now I'm inserting the pit tag into the dorsal muscle of each fish. The pit tag's inserted in each fish so we know which fish it is. When we get our certification report back, it'll tell us whether or not the fish was pure Florida or a hybrid of the northern end of Florida. When it comes time to spawn in the spring, we can uh, know each individual fish according to that report, know whether we need to keep that fish and use it to spawn with, or, or we don't use that fish. There's no way to know for sure just by simply looking at a bass, whether it's a Florida bass or an Oklahoma bass. The, the only way to really know for sure is to look at that DNA and, uh, and find out the answer. Pretty simply what we do is we take the, we basically extract the DNA from fish fins and then we take that DNA, we can tell whether a bass, or a bass was a Florida bass, an Oklahoma bass, or some hybrid between the two of them. So right now, we've uh, digested the fin clips using uh, an enzyme and some heat. So we've broken open the cells to release the DNA from them. And we're adding ammonium acetate, which is going to uh, help us uh, collect the DNA out of that solution that it's in right now. So the DNA is actually on the back side of that tube. And it's clear, and so what happens is you can't see it. We know what the Florida bass sequence is, and so then we compare our samples, our samples DNA sequence to that. And by doing that, we can tell whether a bass is a Florida bass or isn't. What we're doing today is we're relocating our broodstock uh, from some of the ponds that we've uh, kept them in over the winter, and we're going to move those fish into ponds that we've prepared for the spawning process. These fish have been in these ponds for about 10 months since they were spawned last year, and we're going to take those fish, move them into a pond uh, for them to spawn. As we go through these bass and we start to move them from one pond to another, we have fish that were certified last year. Uh, these are two-year-old fish that we brought in. Uh, we took a DNA sample from those fish and inserted a pit tag. Uh, what we'll do with those fish is now we've run the DNA analysis, and so for each fish that has a tag, we, we have a DNA test for that number. So what we do at this point is we go through, we'll scan that fish, inspect the number to make sure that that fish came back as a pure Florida bass. If it did come back as a pure bass, we use it in our broodstock program. If it was unpure, we will remove that fish from the program and we may stock it into an area lake uh, where it can still do some good. One of the reasons that we try to maintain a pure broodstock on our hatchery, uh, we know that uh, pure Florida bass have the growth potential to reach trophy size. We know that if a pure Florida bass uh, reproduces with one of our native northern bass, it produces a hybrid, which also has that potential. But multiple generations of back crossing with our northern, our native northern bass, it waters down the genetic potential of those fish to produce a trophy. So that's why it's very important for us to start with bass that are pure Floridas, uh, because it, it maintains the highest potential that we can have of producing trophy bass.
All right, we're at the Durant State Fish Hatchery today, harvesting our uh, Florida bass fry. Uh, every time we pull a bass out of the water, a brooder, we uh, salt dip them to help with uh, their slime coats. We draw them this pond down. Uh, right now, we're trying to pull the brooders out before all the fry come down. We try to keep the brooders from going into the harvest basins to keep them from getting roughed up. As the pond's coming down, the fry are going into the harvest basin. And then we'll go over to the harvest basin to collect them once all the brooders are out. Right now, we've got all the brooders out of this pond. So now what we're doing is we're waiting on the fry to slowly drain uh, through the pipe at the base of this pond and into the harvest basin below, which is where we'll be in just a minute. So these bass are approximately three quarters of an inch. On average, there's gonna be about 4,100 per pound. So what they're gonna be doing is they're gonna be weighing these fish, which will give us an estimate of how many fish that we have, so we'll know our stocking rates uh, into the next pond that they go into as we try to grow these fish from three quarters of an inch up to an inch and a half fingerling prior to taking them to our lakes. We're fixing to stock out these three quarter inch fish fry into a grow out pond. The fry are left in a pond for roughly uh, 15 days on average. That can vary depending on weather conditions, uh, sunlight, uh, cloudy days are really detrimental to plankton growth. The fry eat the plankton, get good growth, and then just take off uh, to the inch and a half stage. Once they're at the inch and a half stage, we'll harvest these ponds and then that's when they are stocked to the, to the public waters. On average, in Oklahoma, a 10-pound bass is 10 years old. So you think about 8, 9, 10, 12-pound fish coming out of these lakes, it's a long-term investment, and that's where our whole Florida bass program is. When we stock Florida bass in your lake this year, it's going to take a while for those fish to grow up. What we're doing this morning is we're harvesting the fingerling uh, Florida largemouth bass. These are the fish that we're stocking out in our lakes uh, throughout the state. What we're doing is we're taking these fish out and we're weighing them as we put them on the truck. In this particular basin, these fish weigh, there's about 750 uh, fish per pound. So we take the weight of the fish and that gives us an estimate of how many fish are going into the lake. So they're being loaded onto a hatchery truck now and will be taken to the lake where they'll be distributed by boat into quality habitat. The number of lakes that we stock each year depends on uh, how many Florida bass fingerlings are produced. Uh, just like any crop that's being, being raised, there are always good years and bad years depending on uh, environmental conditions and a number of other conditions. So uh, the, the number of lakes that stock, stocked each year will vary, uh, but if a lake isn't stocked in one given year, it gets higher priority to be stocked the following year.
about there. We're there. What we've got is we've got about 30,000 fish for Lake Arbuckle that we're going to be stocking in a cove. Uh, one of the things we want to avoid is stocking these fish near a boat ramp that may be void of good nursery habitat. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll utilize boats to take these fish out into the lake, uh, try to find quality habitat that gives them a better chance of survival. So just as we transferred the fish off of the truck and onto the boat in water utilizing a tube, it prevents us from having to dip net these fish and touch them again. That knocks off the slime coat. It reduces the survival of the fish. So we do all of this to try to keep the fish as healthy as possible whenever we release them into the lake. And so we utilize the, the hoses again at this stage to make sure that uh, the fish remain healthy. What we're doing at this stage, we've now offloaded the fish into one of our acclimation cages here at Lake Arbuckle. And you see, we've got approximately 30,000 fish in this cage. And what we're doing is we're waiting for these fish to start to display some uh, schooling behavior, uh, some predator avoidance behavior. Uh, again, if they came off of a hatchery truck or off of one of these hauling tanks, uh, they've been agitated, they've been bounced around as they're going down the road. And so these fish are very disoriented. And there would not, be nothing to keep these fish from just swimming straight out into open water where they might be eaten by a predator. So what this does, it allows the fish to acclimate themselves, to right themselves, uh, and start to school up. And so we'll usually keep them in this cage anywhere from five to 10 minutes. And once we start to see that behavior and these fish really settle down, then we'll lift this cage and we'll, we'll release these fish. And what we'll see is typically they'll stay in this shallow water area, which has some aquatic vegetation in it and that'll give them a better chance of survival. Got it. So there we have the cloud of fish and they're starting to move off to the right. And one of the things that's really encouraging here is if you see these fish, the biggest majority of these fish that are leaving where we had them, they're, they're moving up into shallower water. They're moving up into this vegetation. They're not going out into deeper water. Uh, so that's encouraging that these fish are going to utilize this shallow water habitat to avoid predators. If you think about the fact that when we stock, say, 100,000 Florida bass fingerlings, every year, 30 to 40 percent of those fish die from natural causes. They get eaten, they die of starvation, something bad happens to them. So you start out with 100,000. The next year you have 70,000. The next year you have 30% less. The next year you have 30% less. And so on, and you keep going down there. Remember it takes 10 years to grow a 10 pounder. By the time you get to 10 years down the road, that 100,000 fish is down to about a thousand. Now you lop off half of them because only the females turn into trophies. So it's a numbers game. When you stock huge numbers of fish, the number of fish that ever have the potential of growing to be trophies gets pretty small. Well now that we know all about how Florida strain largemouth bass are raised here in our state, let's catch up with Skylar St. Ives and find out some tips on how to catch them. Hi, I'm Skylar St. Ives, Aquatic Education and Fishing Coordinator for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Today we're here to help you hopefully catch some more fall bass. Let me show you my playbook that I have set up here. This is what we were just throwing and this is kind of my starter bait. This is what I would call my search bait, especially on a small body of water like this. This is just a two inch tube and well, it's gonna help me catch bass. I'm also gonna catch some bluegill and some crappie mixed in and that's gonna help me kind of determine where I want to fish because if I'm finding bluegill and I'm finding crappie, 
more than likely I'm gonna find bass that aren't too far behind because at this time of year, they are specifically targeting bait fish. They are looking to gorge for the winter. And so my entire playbook of rods that I bring to any body of water is going to start real small and end real big. And I'm gonna use that. So this is what we have to start with. And this is a two inch squirm and squirt tube that's green pumpkin, red and black. You pick your poison, but this is my color of choice. I use this pretty much throughout if I'm not using a specific swim bait. So the next one that I go to, speaking of swim baits, is my search bait. Now this is a pre-molded swim bait. This is gonna be about an eighth ounce, maybe three eight ounce. So I'm gonna throw this out and I'm gonna work Hopefully if I see fish rising or if I see boils, I'm gonna to attempt to throw that into it and it's gonna be a steady retrieve all the way through. Uh, if I'm not finding fish on this, if the surface level is a little bit calmer, I'm gonna start fishing subsurface off the bottom. And that's where we get into our little weightless stick worm right here. Now this is set up wacky rigged, which I prefer. It falls and it pulses as it goes down and all you're doing is you're just popping that rod tip up and all it does is it does this and it slowly drifts back down and you're waiting for that line just to get tight and then you're setting the hook. If maybe it's gonna take a little bit more activity, a little bit more stimulation of the lateral line of that fish, then pretty much fishing the same thing, but we're using a bladed jig, often known as a chatterbait. Now your trailer can be anything. Again, I always work in a green pumpkin, watermelon, with red and black flake. That's just my go-to in Oklahoma. And uh, if you can run through those four deals on any body of water and you're not picking up fish, the bite just might not be good that day. But if you start small and you work your way through search baits up into a creature bait and then into a reactionary bait, which is gonna be something that makes noise like a weighted jig head or a bladed jig head, then uh, you should have a pretty good day in the fall. I'm starting to see a little bit of surface rising over here to our right, so I'm gonna go pick this up and go make a few casts over there and see if we can't get into them. We'll go back to the to the tube that we started with. Um, this is gonna catch your bass and crappie and sunfish, but it gives you a better opportunity to catch more fish because while well, you still might get into those two to five pound fish. Oh, we had one there for a second. Well, thanks for stopping by. Remember, the outdoors are always open. Stay safe and good luck this fall. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget, the outdoors are always open. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.